All right. So these are the uh, problems basically summarized. And now I'd like to look at what kind of uh, attacks are actually possible regarding your private data, your security on a mobile device. Um, I've kind of tried to rank them in increasing order of severity. That's of course open to discussion, but um, I'd like to look at these uh, yeah, in that order. But um, first of all, are there any questions up to here? Anything regarding the uh, problems I've just, uh, I've just mentioned briefly? No, okay. Then let's look into these actual attacks. And attacks is I'm using as a very in a very broad sense here. So um, it's not really an attack, of course, if a cloud provider uh, reuses your personal data, but it's still something that may compromise your privacy. So in the in the widest sense, I'm I'm calling that an attack. Um, I've already briefly mentioned this. Usually cloud providers have access to all of your data. And uh, as soon as you start using the cloud provider, you implicitly agree to some kind of, kind of terms of service. Sometimes they will show you these terms of service. Then you get, get maybe a, a window on your device which shows you uh, 57 pages of text and to actually use the, the service, then you have to agree to it. And I don't think anybody will ever read these 57 pages of text on their mobile device. Usually people just check the box at the bottom and say, all, all right, all right, I, I all agree. And uh, usually what you agree to is that you give the, the cloud provider some kind of license to do with your data what they want, more or less. Even if you have providers which, um, which have very restrictive terms of service for themselves, which try to protect your data, and there are those, you can't be sure that that provider doesn't get bought by another company. And maybe then you uh, suddenly have some completely different kind of terms of service. Sometimes uh, what actually happened to me once with a, a service called Feedly, I think. So that was a, first there was Google Reader, then Google Reader got canceled and a company called Feedly offered to more or less um, offer the same service. Um, then you could transfer all your data to Feedly and um, suddenly after maybe half a year, Feedly started disabling more and more of its features unless you pay. So that uh, is of course a valid business model, but um, it's not kind of what you expect uh, when you sign up for it in the first place. Um, so even, even if you try to keep all of your data to yourselves, basically, don't actually use any cloud services, then your privacy can still be compromised without you actually having to do anything about it. For example, if other people uh, use cloud services to create information about you. So if someone tags you in a photo on Facebook, there's actually not much you can do about it. You can sort of disable that on Facebook in some hidden sub 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 menu, but um, most people don't actually know about this setting, so they don't do it. And even if there are no photos of you on Facebook at all, which you uploaded yourself, there might still be some information Facebook has about how you look um, uh, just by what other people do. So um, there are, of course, alternatives. You might want to use something like OwnCloud, which is, does lots of what you, the usual cloud services do, but you can install it on your own computer. But that, of course, means a lot of work. So it's, again, a trade-off of uh, basically what you want to pay for with your personal data. And even if you use something like OwnCloud exclusively, then you still can run into that kind of problem that other people create information about you on cloud services, sorry, cloud services that still um, um, compromise your privacy in a sense. All right. So then let's continue to the next step in terms of attacks. This is this already sort of implicates uh, a bit of malicious intent. This is called shoulder surfing. So this basically means that someone is looking over your shoulder and 
uh, tries to extract uh, interesting information from what they see on your mobile screen. Um, depending on the scenario, that might be in inevitable. So if you're in a crowded bus or a subway or something and people are really standing close together, then people might just by accident look at your screen um, and see something they're not supposed to see. But there are also scenarios with, where people actually do that with malicious intent. So one example is uh, so-called smudge attacks. If you look closely at this picture, then you can see that you can kind of infer the unlock pattern by just looking at the screen under, under the right angle. So because your fingers will always leave some kind of uh, residue on the screen and if you don't have really dry fingers, which basically nobody has, then you can, by looking at the screen in the right angle, you can infer what the pat pattern is. So if somebody leaves their phone just lying around somewhere, then uh, people might be able to unlock it by just uh, looking at the, the uh, pattern in the right way. Um, so what what's possible to, to do against that? So there was a, a paper at CHI 2013, which you, was called back of device authentication. We already talked about the back of device interaction. And this is a specific scenario where you basically have to do another second stroke on the back of the device, um, which is of course a lot more difficult to spot. Um, but for that to work, you need extra hardware. Um, you might also want to combine um, um, the, the pin input with, with something like eye tracking, or you could use how you, how you grasp your phone, but all of this requires extra sensors with, with, uh, which most devices don't actually have. Um, there's a very simple approach, which would be if you enter a pin to just uh, randomize the layout of the numbers. So usually they're arranged one, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And then you can, of course, also by just looking at where the, the tabs are, you can already uh, guess part of the, of the number space. Um, that wouldn't work anymore if you swap the numbers around every time. But uh, what, wh why isn't this done on mobile devices? What would you say? It would slow down the user. Yeah, exactly. It would slow down the user a lot because usually after you've entered your PIN three or four times, then it's more or less already in, in muscle memory and you can do it without even looking there. But if the numbers would be swapped around every time, then you would have to search for each number every time and it would be a lot slower. And uh, users would probably get annoyed by that, so it's not done. Very simple reason, basically. <clears throat> okay. Um, now let's look at the next uh, kind of attack, which is already really, yeah, it's still, it's still not, 100% criminal, I think. So um, let's look into spyware and malware. So by definition, this is software which either tries to uh, intercept information or misuse resources. So um, on mobile devices, there aren't so many resources available. Um, so it's not uh, su such a big CPU, GPU as you has, have on a desktop computer. Um, can anyone think of an example where, uh, so how malware can actually misuse uh, resources? Like, for example, now if you think about a desktop computer, let's, let's keep mobile aside for a moment. What kind of resource misuse can you think of? Bandwidth. Yeah. Hmm? Bandwidth. Bandwidth, yeah. For what, what do you, so if you actually have uh, malware on your computer, what is the bandwidth sometimes used for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, but what, what specifically? Does anyone have an idea? Um, f for denial of service attacks. So if you have many computers which uh, run some kind of malware and you want to take some website offline, that's actually something you can, you can pay money for and people will do it for you. Of course, it's illegal, but it's, it's possible. Then 10,000 computers somewhere on the internet will just start basically sending ram random garbage data to that single website and then uh, nobody else will be, will be able to reach it anymore. 
So this is one, uh, one aspect of how you can basically misuse resources um, of other people's computers through malware. Um, and you can also see why this isn't such a big problem on mobiles because they simply don't have as much bandwidth usually or as much CPU power and so on. But uh, what they do have is uh, uh, valuable information. And for that reason, most malware on mobile devices uh, could be called spyware. So it's software that somehow tries to steal information off your device. Um, and yeah, so we, we have a big market share for Android. So Android is the, the major target for malware currently. Um, the security model isn't that, uh, that strict. We already talked about this a, a bit. And uh, the, the review process for the uh, Play Store is also very relaxed. So if some kind of software is found to be uh, spyware and you actually report that to Google, then they will usually remove it pretty quickly. But that doesn't mean that uh, not a lot of people will already have installed it. So um, yeah, with Apple, the review process is a lot stricter, so it's less of a problem, but it still happens, even with, uh, with Apple. And with uh, Windows Phone, I actually don't have any numbers because the, the market share of Windows Phone is so small that people uh, actually, actually don't bother to, to write malware for that, as far as I can tell. Um, so the main target is really Android, but also iOS for the simple reason that iOS users tend to have more money than uh, Android users. So it's still valuable to, to try and get access, for example, to uh, the data of iOS users, even if there are less of them and it's more difficult, um, it's still being tried. Um, so just a, just a brief sidetrack, let's briefly look at how the, the security model of Android actually looks like. So underneath the, the, the shell which you interact with, Android is actually just Linux, mostly. So the security model is also uh, based on the one from Linux. Every app actually gets its own user account, um, its own UID. So the apps are isolated from each other in the first place. Um, so you can't actually directly read the data which is, uh, which is stored by another app. You can only do that by using these kinds of APIs which, which Android provides, for example, to access the contact data or something like that. Um, but the big problem is, I've already mentioned this, you can usually just approve uh, permissions as a whole. And even with Android 5, where this changed a little bit, where you can now grant individual permissions or uh, disallow them, they are still very, very coarse. So you can only give ac access to the whole address book or not at all. And if you deny uh, access to that permission, then the app will, uh, in most cases, either crash or uh, at least display an error message. That, that won't work. So if you want to use that app, uh, then you don't, don't actually have any choice. Yes? Is that problem of the operating system or the, the development of the app? Well, it's, <laughs> well, it's kind, of, kind of both. Because you could still, of course, if you're a, a developer which wants to, to provide the best possible user experience, then you could write your app in such a way that it can still work if the permission is denied. But um, most people don't do that. Um, and it's also a problem on the operating system side because the permissions are still very, yeah, very coarse. So you can't really give fine-grained permissions. Of course, that would also, uh, again, place some kind of, of burden on the user because they have to, would have to make more decisions. So it's sort of a trade-off. And in most cases, uh, at least from the operating system side, uh, the, the bias was towards making it very easy for the user. So you just have to approve everything once and then it won't ask you again. Uh, but of course, that has, has implications for, um, for privacy. Yes, please. These are different to iOS? Um, not much difference, actually. I think iOS introduced earlier this feature that you can, uh, can grant permissions from time to time, 
so you don't actually have to uh, approve everything when you install the app, but you, uh, when the app actually wants to access your GPS or your camera, then it asks you. Um, but also on iOS, I think most apps, if you deny the permission, then the app just won't work. It won't find another way to, to deal with that. Uh, it just won't do anything. So uh, iOS was a little earlier with introducing this, uh, this permission scheme that you can grant the permissions from time to time and retract them afterwards also. But um, apart from that, I think there's not much of a difference. <clears throat> Any other questions regarding this? Okay, so now let's look a little more into um, spyware and malware, how it can actually work based on that. So uh, to actually get the user to grant you permission in the first place, um, most apps can be classified, most malicious apps can be classified as Trojans. So it's the, the metaphor of the tro Trojan horse. Um, it looks like it provides something useful, maybe just a game, uh, maybe uh, some kind of messaging, I don't know. Um, but in any case, the user has to grant permission up front and then it has additional hidden functionality that's uh, actually malicious. So that's the, um, that's the basic idea. Um, really, malware that just has one single malicious purpose, that's relatively rare. There's only actually one example I know, know of. There's a well-known uh, Trojan for Windows called Zeus and that actually has a mobile component. So if your computer is infected with SUS, then it uh, may, depending on the version, it may prompt you to actually connect your mobile phone to the computer. Then it will upload a dedicated malicious app to your phone, and that is then used to gain access to your bank account. So if you go to your uh, bank's website, then SUS on the desktop computer will uh, capture your login data, and the mobile component will then capture the PIN number sent to you by SMS. And both together will send that data to uh, some criminal who will then use it to clean out your bank account. So, but this is, a, uh, this is a really, really complex system of several, several components which have to play together. But there have been cases where people have lost, uh, lost tens of thousands of euros because of exactly this malware. So it has been actually used in uh, stealing people's money. Um, there was, I think there was one more. Yeah, right, okay. That's, uh, so what's, what people try to do is to, to find that kind of malware is to actually analyze it in a so-called sandbox. So this is basically the Android emulator with additional uh, capabilities to log data. And afterwards, um, the, um, the data will be analyzed by some kind of machine learning algorithm, for example, to find apps which don't conform to the, to the uh, regular uh, patterns. So um, this is kind of an arms race because uh, the people who write malware, of course, don't want it to be analyzed because if you can analyze it, then you can basically defend against it. Um, and so they try to make their apps look as innocent as possible. And specifically, they also try to detect when the app is running in such a sandbox and as opposed to running on a real mobile device. And there have been several, uh, several kinds of tricks uh, that have been used to uh, by the malware to actually find out if it's running in the sandbox. For, so for example, it tries to look at the uh, IMEI, the uh, equipment number of the mobile device. Uh, sometimes emulators will just report that as zero because they're not running on actual hardware. Um, then there has been malware which tries to um, tries to vibrate the phone a little and then measure the data coming from the accelerometer if the device is actually moving a little. Uh, sometimes they try to play sound and also record that on the microphone, which also sometimes doesn't work in the emulator. Um, but what most of them actually do is just wait for some kind of user input. 
So if you just launch the app, then it won't do anything malicious in the first place, only after the user has uh, tapped some buttons, uh, for example. For that reason, again, the sandbox, for example, tries to actually generate random, random uh, simulated input events so that the app thinks it's being used and uh, at some point will, will trigger the malicious behavior of trying to extract, um, extract the address book, for example, or intercept SMS messages, what, whatever. So this is yeah, kind, of a, kind of a race between the malware authors and the security people who try to analyze that malware and that will probably continue for the uh, foreseeable future in, in that way. Uh, there will be new anal analysis or new security features will be introduced and the malware authors will then try to find a way around that again. Um, so for that reason, it always pays to be uh, kind of attentive as a user and uh, for example, think about if a game you want to install really needs to access your address book. Unfortunately, there are actually games which aren't that malicious and still want to, to have access to your address book just because then you can send a high score to your friends, for example. So it's really sometimes quite difficult to tell um, yeah, what, what uh, if it's actually malicious behavior that might be behind that or not. Um, Oh, there's one more aspect which I forgot, which, which is also interesting on mobile devices, which some malware also does, is send very expensive SMS messages. So you can buy stuff via SMS message, or you can call a 0190 number, which will cost five euros a minute. And uh, sometimes uh, people who write malware have set up s uh, those numbers and have written malware which actually then sends SMS or makes calls to those numbers automatically so they can collect, uh, collect fees from the, from the mobile provider. And the mobile provider will then of course get the money back from you. So in the end, they will also steal money from you uh, via that route. Okay, yes. Well, the sandbox is basically the Android emulator or the iOS emulator um, with an additional component that tries to analyze how, the, how a specific app behaves. So it will automatically install, for example, Google has something like that in the Play Store. If you upload a new app, then it will automatically be installed in this sandbox and uh, it will simulate some user trying to use that app. And the sandbox will then try to analyze if the behavior of that app somehow looks suspicious. So that's the basic idea. And afterwards, the, the operating system image will, will just be wiped and the next app will be, will be tested. Yeah? How is this related to security? Well, this is uh, basically what people try to find security issues. So if you have an app which, um, for example, yeah, tries to, to access data which it actually shouldn't, then this is something, this is of course a security issue, and then the sandbox should be able to detect that. So that's the idea. Yes? Um, going back to application permissions, is there any way for an application to inter interact with uh, a permission prompt? For instance, if my application needs GPS access and then prompts the user to grant that permission, um, I'm guessing that the prompt that we see is an external application, but would there be any way for my application to interact with that prompt? Say well, by there. emulating uh, touch button presses that... There's, so I think there, there shouldn't be a way, but um, that's, that's not saying that there isn't maybe some bug uh, that actually allows you to, to do that anyway. So you're, you're thinking about can an app basically give itself permission to do something without the user noticing? Basically, is that kind of the idea behind your question? Well, it shouldn't be possible, but yeah, again, there might very well be some bug that actually allows you to do that in some way. So, um, for example, there are some apps which uh, request um, permission to your keyboard. So 
uh, you can actually install different keyboards on, uh, on Android. Uh, and I'm not sure if it wouldn't maybe somehow be possible for a keyboard app to fake that, that uh, button press to give itself additional permissions which the user doesn't know about. It shouldn't be possible, but may, it might well be that there's a, uh, some, some hidden way to actually do that after all. I don't know if anybody's tried that yet. None, none I know of, but um, it might still be one. So, okay. Other questions?